supermassive black holes lie at the centre of every galaxy. Even though they're millions of light years away, we can determine the black hole's mass from just a few telescope observations over the course of only weeks or months. This is the aim of reverberation mapping, a primary astrophysical mass estimation technique. Before discussing how it works, we must first understand the structure and dynamics of what we're studying. These supermassive black holes have masses millions to billions times that of our own sun. And even though they are tiny in size compared to the galaxies they reside in, their physical processes, beyond just their immense gravity, greatly influence the evolution of the entire galaxy over time, strongly affecting its structure and composition. When supermassive black holes are accreting matter and doing cool things to influence their host galaxy, we refer to them as active galactic nuclei, or AGN, for short. The typical structure of an AGN is as follows. At the centre is the aforementioned supermassive black hole, which is surrounded by an accretion disk of gas and dust from the interstellar medium. These are leftover molecules from the galaxy's formation and the products of dead stars, which are gradually falling into the black hole. Surrounding the accretion disk is usually a dusty torus. This is a sort of donut shape of turbulent material which can obscure our line of sight to the central black hole. There may also be gas clouds much further from the black hole, which I'll get onto more later. The black hole may also be emitting collimated outflows of shocked gas from its poles. Shocked here means that the emitted gas is moving at extremely high, almost relativistic velocities. These are referred to as the AGN jets, and recent studies indicate that they strongly affect the evolution of the entire galaxy by redistributing matter from the centre to the outskirts. The changes to galaxies caused by AGN is referred to as astrophysical AGN feedback, and it's a hot topic for current research, with entire hydrodynamical simulations being run in order to understand it better. There are many different classifications of AGN, which you have likely heard of before. These include things like quasars, blazars, starbursts, safer type 1 and 2s, radio AGN, and so on. I won't explain what each are here, but what's crucial in understanding is that most of these types of AGN are actually the same sort of objects, but observed from different viewing angles. For example, this is quite a good diagram showing that same typical AGN anatomy and how it could be categorised differently depending on how you're observing it. If we see it straight on from the energetic jets, will likely detect a strong radio source and subsequently classify it as a quasar or blazar if it's right at us. If we see it more edge on and we are seeing the dusty torus which is strongly obscuring the central black hole, the light we receive is likely more in the infrared and the luminosity might be much smaller and so one could classify it as a safer. The classification isn't important, it's usually just how we are observing the object, at least this is the current consensus. Now back to reverberation mapping. In order to apply this method, we must select AGN with what's known as a broad line region, or BLR. What are these, you're wondering? Well, for once, astronomers have given something a sensible name. Broad line regions are quite literally the region around the supermassive black hole, in which their spectra can be characterised by having broad emission lines for different transitions. The way objects such as galaxies and AGN are studied is through the light to be received from them. This light is the result of atomic transitions, where electrons in atomic and molecular gas clouds get excited by starlight and then eventually drop down to lower energy levels. When this happens, a photon is emitted with a discrete energy which corresponds to which element, molecule, or whatever, and which transition. Essentially, it's due to basic quantum mechanics. So we can work out what chemicals make up a galaxy or region by matching up their emission lines to known frequencies by comparing to different transitions in the lab. There's a lot more that goes into it than that, such as accounting for redshift and dust extinction, but for our purposes we just need to be aware that the shape of these emission lines varies based on the kinematics of the gas. The broad line regions originate from the gas around the supermassive black hole being highly turbulent and moving at great velocities. This causes the shape of the emission profile to widen due to additional Doppler broadening. Put simply, the broadening is due to the gas being close to the AGN, the light from the AGN gets absorbed and then re-emitted by the gas in the broad line region, and crucially, it's this mechanism we can use to deduce the mass of the central black hole. Now, we can't usually see the black hole directly, as discussed earlier, but we can see the light from the broad line region surrounding it. However, the continuum emission from the AGN naturally varies over time, due to what it's accreting in its accretion disk and other factors. 
Some of this continuum emission is able to escape through the dusty torus and broad line region of the AGN, where we can detect it directly, and some of it gets absorbed and re-emitted by gas in the broad line region. So what we are seeing is a combination of the light directly from the AGN, which builds up a continuum, and also reprocessed light from the broad line region, which typically gives the emission lines of different atomic transitions. Then, when the AGN emission varies in brightness or frequency over time, we are quick to observe it in the continuum emission. However, there is a time delay in when we see the change in the reprocessed emission from the broad line region, since the light has to travel to the broad line region and get absorbed and then re-emitted. These broad line regions typically lie several light days to light weeks from the central supermassive black hole, depending on the luminosity of the AGN, hence why there's a detectable time delay in the change we see. Therefore, if we measure this time delay or time lag between seeing a variation in the continuum emission of the AGN to seeing the corresponding change in the emission of the broad line region, we can use this to estimate the size of the broad line region. Since we know the speed of light is constant, and since the time lag is due to the light having to travel from the central supermassive black hole to the broad line region. From then, we can look at the width of the emission lines to infer the velocity of the gas in the clouds, and use the Virial theorem to estimate the mass of the supermassive black hole, because we know that its gravitational force is the dominant force governing the motion and position of the gas clouds in the centres of galaxies. This is because the supermassive black hole contains almost all the mass at the centres of galaxies typically being millions of times that of the Sun. Thus, their gravity is what's dominating the potential at the center. This is the theoretical foundation of reverberation mapping. To help with understanding, I'll now go through this again, explaining how it's done step by step in reality. We point our telescopes towards the center of a galaxy with an AGN. This is essentially an accreting supermassive black hole. Over time, properties such as the brightness or frequency of light coming directly from the AGN vary. We see this directly as a change in the continuum emission of the AGN through our telescope. However, some AGN have clouds of molecular gas several light days away from the black hole, which are very good at absorbing the light from the AGN and re-emitting it. We call this the broad line region. So those changes in the emission from the AGN also cause the emission from these clouds to change. But because light from the AGN has to reach them, which takes a finite amount of time, we only observe the change in emission from these clouds at a time after seeing the AGN continuum change. The time difference is what we want to measure because it corresponds to the distance between the black hole and the broad line region. So we measure this using our telescopes. It can take between weeks and years. Once we have a good measurement for the time delay, and equivalently the size of the broad line region, we can apply some theory about how structures form under gravity in order to estimate the mass of the black hole at the centre of the galaxy. This is reverberation mapping. There are a few other caveats that are worth mentioning. Firstly, the side of the broad line region which is closest to us, so the blue shifted side, will be seen to vary first. This makes sense as the red shifted side is further away from us, so light has further to travel before we see it. This can make estimating the time delay a bit confusing if you don't account for it. Also, the theory we apply to estimate the black hole mass from the broadline region size also depends on the geometry of the gas clouds that make up the broadline region, and also the way we model the emission lines. Both of these require some assumptions to be made, such as assuming the gas clouds have spherical symmetry, or that the emission lines follow a Gaussian function, making the black hole mass estimates slightly dependent on how one decides to model each system. Nevertheless, reverberation mapping is an innovative and interesting way to measure the mass of a supermassive black hole in a faraway galaxy. So far, only around 40 supermassive black holes have been mapped this way, as it does depend on having favourable geometry and viewing angle of the AGM. If you'd like to learn more, I will leave links to papers in the description. If you've enjoyed, then leaving a like and subscribing if you haven't already greatly helps out my channel, and I'll see you next time.